a 67 year old male with asymptomatic abdominal lymphadenopathy. And he had a follicular lymphoma diagnosed on September 22nd of 2011, had stage 4A disease. That should be his AMC was 760, not ALC, I'm sorry. And he was treated on study uh, with lenalidomide, rituximab, cyclophosphamide, and dexamethasone and went into a complete remission. He relapsed in 2013 and he was initially observed. He then had progressive lymphadenopathy, got biopsied in, on January 5th of 2016, and again follicular lymphoma, got six cycles of BR to a CR. Then, while standing in front of the mirror in April of 2018, he noted a symmetry in the inguinal area, and the CT revealed a 5.6 by 3.9 centimeter node. And he has a significant vascular history, and so there's a pretty good size node around that area where he has a lot of vasculopathy. Had follicular disease, got treated with six cycles of RCHOP, and by DeVille criteria, the response was a 2 on October 3rd of 2018, and at a repeat pet with a DeVille score of 4 on December 13th of 2018. As I mentioned, he is a bit of a vasculopath. Um, his exam was unremarkable. Uh, his AMC has, has been persistently high. Low. LDH was normal. Uh, could we see the radiology, please? Yes, uh, Jason Young, radiology. So I'm focusing on his most recent uh, three PET scans. So this is uh, the July 5th, 2018 exam. You can see a, a conglomerate of lymph nodes in his left inguinal region. Uh, and then I'll just point your attention here to this little spot uh, that we'll look at in the future. So uh, after treatment, he, this is him at Deval 2. You know, it's pretty much all melted away. Uh, if on the axial images, there is a, a, a bit of uptake. Uh, and then uh, this is just sternotomy. This is a, these are, I don't think these are areas of disease, just incidentals. And then moving forward to December 2013, I'm sorry, December 13th of 2018, uh, you can see a little uptake here. There's not much disease. If we look uh, on the axial images at these sites, you know, this is currently uh, 4.2 SCV max. Here's the interval, and then we started with uh, 7. 0.5. There's lower level uptake in that inguinal region, about equal to blood pool. Uh, the node itself is 2.7 by 1.8 centimeters. We've, we're calling this presacral. It's kind of central mesenteric and low, but this is the primary uh, site of disease. And then you can see here, even, you know, this is pro quite large, but not FDG avid. A lot of this is probably scar, but may still also be viable. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Can we see the pathology, please? Yes. This is the left inguinal lymph node that was taken May 2018. We have uh, areas of nodular, primarily nodular areas, and uh, off the screen a little bit more areas of some diffuse it's a relatively dense lymphoid infiltrate. On higher power, the cells are predominantly small uh, central sites. A uh, couple scattered central blasts are in the background. Predominantly, again, there are central sites that are highlighted by CD20. BCL2, they are weak for CD10, also positive for nuclear stain for BCL6. You can see that CD21 highlights uh, some background intact follicular dendritic cell meshworks. Uh, the biopsy on May 2nd and two months later uh, are <coughs> follicular lymphoma low grade, either one or one to two. Thank you. So how should we treat this individual who started out in 2011 with stage 4A disease with a high AMC, which has persisted? He's been through three treatments now. Um, these are potential options. And just to set the stage for a moment, uh, lots of things to do. This was the uh, AMC data that's, uh, uh, and uh, the outcomes there. Uh, 
uh, the Prima 1 prognostic uh, system. We don't have a beta 2 microglobulin, but he did have a positive marrow, so this put him at a progression free survival uh, 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 that would be at 57% uh, in, in the MER. Um, and then middle line, and then uh, those though that achieved the EFS 24, which he just achieved actually, uh, they don't do too badly up there in the uh, in the blue line. But this guy's gotten much more aggressive uh, in, over this last year, and so this is long the long term uh, data that we've just published. Uh, and essentially out of over 1,500 cases with a French and a U.S. cohort, the 10-year overall survival rates were 80 and 77 percent. The, uh, in the cumulative instance of death from lymphoma at 10 years was 10 percent. And uh, the incidence of death as a result of lymphoma was higher as, as, as a result of all other causes for patients who have failed to achieve the MS-24. 36% versus 7%, and then transformation was also worse. So we looked at the pooled analysis, no difference between things, and this is where he would fall out in this age group, and the, his the lymphoma-related death, he's at, at risk for that, and that's starting to approach 20% when we get out beyond 12, uh, 12 years. And then if you transform, then it's a worse much worse problem. With maintenance rituximab after RCHOP, the data, this was not the way it was initially treated, but uh, it's kind of an interesting tantalizing thing still, the median progression free survival being 10 and a half years versus four years in the PRIMA study. Now we have abinutuzumab um, and uh, the three-year progression free survival with R chemo versus G chemo, you can see was different for G chemo. And uh, but the regimen dependent death rates were higher with bendamustine, the gallium study. I think the, the reason I want to bring him forward is to talk a little bit about what the role of transplant is. Uh, untreated disease, we had the couple trial out of the uh, pre rituximab era with improved progression free and overall survival, which was terminated earlier, early. Uh, in relapse disease, uh, this was a summary in 2018, which is reasonably well written and detailed. The five-year progression-free survivals of 50 to 60 percent, and overall 56 to 90 percent, and the 10-year progression-free 30 to 50, and 10-year overall survival of 40 to 77. This came out of the EBMT, looking at auto versus uh, RILO, and uh, this is all retrospective data. And uh, of interest, the progression-free and overall survival at five years was no different, but the more progress uh, earlier with the auto uh, versus the other uh, uh, mortality, the mortality rates were higher in the RILO cases. And so the question is, what do I do with this guy? Um, and I've not made a decision at this point in time. I thought it would be good to hear from others, uh, get some other thoughts. So we'll open this up for discussion. Steve, as a transplanter. So I think there's a, a fork in the road, and it really comes down to kind of your gut feel for the patient. So the fork in the road is if you think this is a guy who's kind of having shorter and shorter remissions with each therapy, and those are the kinds of patients where older data would support doing an autologous transplant in the hopes of getting a more durable remission. But the reason I say there's a fork in the road is that, you know, I think the data for lenalidomide rituximab in frontline and also even in second line has really been really very encouraging. So one of the questions might be, you know, sort of how do you like to pull off a Band-Aid? Are you more kind of a rip person or pull it slow person? Um, you know, I think giving a treatment that's a longer term therapy that's kind of all the time to keep the disease controlled, the lenalidomide rituximab option, versus go with a sort of a high dose, beat it down and then have no therapy, uh, although you could still make a case for considering a maintenance approach after that, but I think the data is pretty thin. I would just do the transplant and stop. I'm such a rip off the band aid guy. I gave him the LR, LR in 2011. Oh, right. Okay. Back. <laughs> <laughs> and so. Performance status zero. Performance score zero. Yeah. And what bothers me is that 
Or he's really shortening the, you know, the, uh, the wind, you know, he, he relapses quick. And I mean, we've treated him, BR, our chop, you know, now what's left, we already gave him the, you know, I agree with Steve, that's, that was my first thought about him, and then I forgot exactly what he got in 2011. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I, how about, a, how about thinking about a car T at some point rather than something a little more, can we CAR T uh, follicular disease? I mean, you have not, not commercial, CAR -T outside of a trial. clinical trial. Yeah. So, and right now, we, CAR T cell trials are not available for follicular lymphoma. Here, yeah, there are other places, right? The other thing I just point out about the lenalidomide, he did have LRCD, which was, if I remember correctly, six cycles yep. of yep, lenalidomide. Yep. So he didn't really get the L, yep, L R yep. kind of regimen as per so the fair. relevance trial. So Zevalin is a FDA approved indication for this, 80% yes. response rate. It, I think the fork in the road, as Steve said, is if you're going to go, you're going to go for a home run or are you going for a base hit? You're, you, you know, you're, you're going to get a response with Zevalin and then about a year and a half from now he'll be back maybe, you know, in a needing treatment again and then you've given him radium therapy. So every, every hit you give him is a little more risk for other things down the road. Uh, Right now, with his history, he's in good shape clinically, but you know, he's got a little bit of a history here uh, as far as his vascular disease. And right now, to do an auto on him, I wouldn't have any concerns. But, you know, these are the kinds of patients who start to get other problems. And he's, he's, on, he's only 67. Dr. Witzigan, I don't think that's very old anymore. Oh, neither does Dr. Stafford. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and my uh, wife would shoot me if I thought that was old. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I, I want to be as aggressive at this point in time as I can be. Uh, you... What is the rate of uh, mobilization failure after receiving Zevalin? Dr. Ansel wrote that paper. Five off to Zevalin. Um, <laughs> Long time ago, he showed that you can harvest in there. Correct. Transplant. So it's not a, now and, and I think also with the use of Parixifor and yeah. other agents now, that's, oh, that's not really an issue. I would also just comment on what Tom said. You know, I don't think a transplant in this circumstance is really the home run. It's like, do you want a first base hit or a second base hit? You know, I think Rituxan, uh, Zebulon maybe gets you a first base hit, but I think transplant doesn't probably get you much more than a second base hit. We have trials for this, too. Oh, we double, have the yeah. Pembrolizumab trial. <laughs> <Trick it guy. laughs> so... <laughs> with that, um, so I think, yeah, let's take a vote. Uh, how many favor? Or let's just uh, take uh, how many? How many vote for number four? Uh, I'm feeling it. How many vote for uh, so no votes for number four? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, look behind you. Yeah, I can go for that. He's got well, more, he's he's got more yeah, yeah, right now. And That's how many? Uh, how many would vote for Zeb uh, for uh, yttrium ninety tyxetin? It's not a it's not a trial. There's no random there's no randomization on number two. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I'd probably give them a transplant if they do it. Okay. We'll go. So I'll I'll let the patient know that our consensus is uh, auto transplant and we'll get them set up to see someone. I bet you. I bet you though that CAR T is going to be is going to be there for follicular someday. So and I think, Tom, you're quite right. I mean, the data in the limited number of, of folliculars is really excellent. The point has just been the path to approval was easier in the large cell lymphoma. Sparrow, a question or comment? I'm just curious on two things. You no know, autologous, I mean, blasted with high dose chemotherapy, so more is better, along all those principles that we use as one of the stem cell transplant. If we are able to get a good um, stem cell uh, harvest, um, he is still likely to relapse after that because I think follicular just has that, it, it survives. It's like grass, you know, that's what follicular is. And my concern is with all of these multiple treatments we're doing, it is also at risk of developing MDS in somewhere in the near future. I know. That's a, um, she's exactly right. We share so, that uh, same concern. Yeah. I, I'm glad you brought it up. And yeah. I didn't put any slides in about that, but no, that's and there's a lot of data out there on that. So if we did sort of, I mean, 
And train of thought went to, okay, reduced and so transplant, but we use the rituxin or any other CD20-directed purging. And, and after that, leave him on that lenalidomide as maintenance as a retrial again. I don't know if we will prolong the interval between him developing an MDS or whatever. It's, it's, it's a very theoretical thought. I appreciate the thoughts and comments.